Good morning, church. How's everybody doing this morning? Hooray. Another beautiful day. You guys dialed up another beautiful day. We are so blessed here at church. Good morning at home, church. How are you doing this morning? Isn't it amazing how we can hear them? That's great. <laughs> that is so cool. Church, we'd like to uh, open the service this morning with a new song. It's titled Promises. The, the, the first verse sings, God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. And we read in Psalms 119.58, I have sought your face with all my heart. Be gracious to me according to your promises. You ready to praise and worship, church? Would you please stand?
Would you please be seated? Good morning, Christ family. Whew. I don't know about you guys, but I've got a half a day's work put in already, and I'm wore out. <laughs> uh, what you can't see is, is what some of us that show up a little earlier get to see, and that's the water on the stage, the water dripping from the canopy, uh, the washout marks underneath, and things like that. So it's amazing to me to watch how God works through his people to be able to come and, and uh, make this <laughs> presentable so that we can lift him up. And I, I'm, just, I'm just thrilled to be a part of it. Yeah. Uh, just uh, the, the basic cleanup stuff. Does everybody know our website? CFCC.church? All right, well, that's good to know. The connection card that we have out there by the back table, if you're just first time, second time visitor, haven't filled anything out for us to communicate with you or vice versa, uh, it's, a, it's a great way for us to be able to be available to you. And, and if you're signed up for a team already or something like that, it gives us the, the chance to be able to reach, reach out to you and, and let you know when, when we need you for certain teams, things like that. Um, on the back of that card, is a, one of probably the most important part of it, and that is prayer requests. Uh, those will go out to, to our prayer team. Uh, the, uh, the elders, of course, get it on, on Monday, and we, we do pray over those on our, during our meeting. Um, the prayer team come, has a meeting on Tuesday mornings that they come in and do, the, do likewise, and, and if there's anything immediate, we certainly get that out as well. Um, tithing. Just real quick, we leave that up to you and God. We, we have a box back there on the table that we use. Um, but again, nobody sees what who gives what. We, that's not what we're here for. But we do uh, appreciate anything and everything that, that y'all have been able to do for us so far and uh, for God's kingdom. Easter Sunday, we, have, we are going to have two services. The time are going to be a little bit different than what we're doing right now. They're going to be at 9 and 11. Uh, so the transition in the parking lot, you know, being important, you know, we're kind of going to want to watch out for that. Uh, kind of on that end, when we get ready to exit the, the parking lot here, the first crossover is a little less safe than the second one. The second one has, for those of you going south, uh, the second one has a left turn lane to give you some cover from <laughs> whatever's coming up behind you. Uh, Rich and Becky Stripmatter have uh, connected us with uh, the Homeless Coalition here in Citrus County and have done a great job in facilitating uh, getting things don from donated here. And, and Rich and I go you know, go through the things that are donated here on Sunday and distribute them out to the, to the Homeless Coalition of Citrus County and where I've partnered up with, uh, we've partnered up with, and thank you for all the, the donations, is with the Sanctuary Mission uh, and Grace House. And uh, again, they, on their behalf, thank you. Uh, it's an ongoing mission. They don't, they don't give up, they don't stop. They, they just keep plugging away, and, and it's really neat to see what, what they are able to do in the lives of the people that are involved with the uh, drug and alcohol recovery programs. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our restrooms are back here, the Rolls-Royce. Maybe, maybe more, more along the line of a Cadillac. We've got a handle problem on one of them. Uh, <laughs> We do talk a lot about transparency around here. Um, just don't be revealing, okay? Lock the door. Please. <laughs> and, and with that, rim shot. <laughs> uh, He's here every week, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully, not for long. I'll let these fine folks get back to you. Let's go, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day such a beautiful day that you have brought to us. Lord, we just thank you for the tough times, the rough times, and these 
these times here where, where we can get to enjoy your creation, your beauty, and, and your fresh air. And, and Lord, we just thank you so much for the gifted talent here on this stage that's going to present uh, these worship, this worship to you. And it's your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, church, would you please stand? I, I jumped Jesse there. This is my bad. <laughs> This is, a, this is an oldie right here for some of us from 90s kids, all right? We'll remember this one. Yeah, it's on my notes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. to see you open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you to see you high and lifted up shining in the light of your glory your power and love as we sing holy 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 open the eyes of my heart lord open the eyes of my heart i want to see you i want to see you open the eyes of my heart lord to see you. Sing it out, church. Come on. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see to see you one more time open the eyes of my heart Lord open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Amen.
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be same God who never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out.
that nothing can stand against, and not just to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names, nothing can stand against, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will let your name Would you please be seated, church? You know what's really cool is today marks a year since we walked through that door. And Patrick didn't know that when he put me on the schedule. So I'm thankful for that, and I'm thankful for you guys and this band here. Amen? Um, I do want to talk about um, serving and what it means to be faithful. Uh, I want to read some scripture out of 2 Samuel chapter 9. I'm going to try and get his name right because even though I went to Bible school, I still get names jacked up. It's, it's hard. I don't know where they got these names. It wasn't from America, that's for sure. So David showed some, some kindness to Meshibosheth. Um, and we're going to start in verse 1. He says, now David said, is there any, anyone still who is left from the house of Saul that I, that I may show him kindness? And there was a servant in the house of Saul. Name was Ziba or Ziba. So when they had called him to David, David said, are you Ziba? He said, at your service. And then the king said, is there not someone of the house of Saul whom I may show kindness, the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan who is lame at his feet. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is at the house of Makur. I don't know if I need to roll my tongue with that. But, and then the son of Emil in Lodabar, the king sent and brought him out of the house of Makur and said to Emil from Lodabar, Now when Meshibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul had to come. He fell on his face, prostrate, prostrated himself, and said to Meshibosheth, and he said, answered, here is your servant. So David said, do not fear. I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan's, your father's sake, and will restore all the land of your grandfather, and you shall eat the bread of my table continuously. So, I mean, it goes on, but I want to, I want to think about this in our meditation. Outside of your spouses, has somebody made, and that you kids, don't worry about spouses. Um, wait till you go, go with college and everything else, but... Has somebody made a vow to you or you made a vow to somebody and you kept it? Or did they break it? Now, you're thinking about, you think about Jonathan and his relationship with David. And meanwhile, his father's continually trying to kill them, David. And Jonathan's still best friends with him. They hold each other accountable and they made a vow to one another about taking care of the family. 
David kept his vow, though he mourned the loss of his friend, and he even mourned for Saul's, the loss of Saul in battle. But he kept his vow, just as Jesus kept his vow to the church. Saul went astray from God. The children of God went astray from God. And yet, he still kept his vow to love us and to keep us and not forsake us, which is an awesome thing. Now, you think about the church. I thought about this being the anniversary of our, our coming to Christ Family Christian Church. Now, we united our servants, and we bow down to Jesus. Amen? So when we, when we think about that, the faithfulness of David and Jesus being anointed king and the faithfulness of Jesus unto death to save us so that we can go and turn and make disciples for Christ, to make them Christ followers, to see that God has kept his vow with us. David said to Meshibosheth that he's keeping a vow for his father's sake and that you can eat at my table continuously. Gave him Zeba and all his sons. Well, you too can eat at the king's table continuously. Amen? That's what it's about. It's about celebrating that we get to eat at the king's table. We are the body of Christ that get to eat at the king's table. That's exciting, isn't it? No matter what we have done, we did not deserve it. David went back, even though Meshibosheth didn't deserve it, David kept his vow. Today, as the men come forward and pass the communion down the rows, I want you to think about your vow to God or your vow to a friend to help them or your vow when you accepted Christ to go into the world and make disciples. That's an exciting opportunity when you see somebody come to Christ and are, is baptized and they fall prostrate and say, Lord, here's my sins. You do the same. Amen?
body which was broken for you and me. The cup that resembles the blood of Jesus Christ. Father God, we thank you for letting us partake. And Lord, we ask that you would continue to let us remember the reason we do this, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for letting us be a part of Christ Family Christian Church. So 1 Thessalonians 5 says to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I just want to stop real quick before we get into today's topic and just be very thankful for what you guys do around here. The Tim kind of already mentioned the hard work that goes into just getting this place dry enough to not swim in when you're up here and uh, do church uh, the way we do it here. But I want to stop and just be really, very thankful um, to a couple of individuals here. Um, our guy who runs our sound booth, Frank back there, the guy in the green shirt, when you get a chance to, uh, to out of here today, hug that guy, tell him what a great job he does. When you meet outside, sometimes computers decide they no longer want to be computers. Uh, heat, dust, water, you fill in the blank, and we had one of those happen this last week, and Frank spent all day here yesterday setting up our new one just to get these things to do what they do. You'll see there's some, some, some minor things we haven't finished yet, but I'm sure he'll spend all day tomorrow getting the last touches. Uh, my lovely daughter, Savannah, also spent some hours doing that, and so I just, I'm very thankful for what you guys do. Yeah. There is such a heart of servanthood around here, and um, it just, it's just a lot that, that happens, even in the woods, out in the field, there's a lot that happens to get to what we call church on Sunday morning, and I, I love doing it with you guys. I heard Dwayne's heart up here about uh, just getting, I, I can tell he's passionate about being with you guys and being part of what's happening here. I, I agree with him 100%, um, and likewise, uh, Dwayne and your family, we, we, are, we are blessed to have you as part of this. So. We are going through the book of James. If you're new with us, we, uh, we are the 2022 version of the James gang, um, and it's been a fun ride. There's just so much wisdom in James, and as I was studying this this week, you know, there's a lot of similarities between what James is saying and what Jesus preached on the Sermon on the Mount, right? I don't know if you guys have ever looked at those two side by side, and this is James, the younger brother of Jesus, and so he probably has heard a thing or two out of his big brother's mouth. Uh, it might have been at the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus preached that great sermon. Uh, we went through that last year. What a great a bunch of wisdom from our Lord and Savior, right? And you can kind of see a little bit of what James is saying being echoed from maybe what he heard around the house or his older brother. And, you know, the tradition has it that he wasn't a follower of Christ early on. But as we know, you see a risen Savior, no matter whose family he grew up in, um, there's something different about that. And James realized that. And he writes this lovely uh, letter to the scattered churches, probably the first uh, book of the New Testament written, uh, written probably somewhere between 47 and 50 A.D., and he's seen what we, um, what we see actually sometimes. Maybe churches aren't scattered, but they are definitely going through some tough times, right? There's definitely some persecution. There's definitely, um, and uh, there's, I mean, let's face it, there's an assault on church. Uh, we're in a very good country where we can do this, and we can freely come here and say the name of Jesus. But uh, we're, not all countries have this option, guys. There's a lot of countries out there where being a Christ follower gets you in some trouble, and, and we're still blessed to do that here. Um, I do see church changing. Uh, I see a lot of, uh, attack, like I said, attack on uh, our ability to do this. But for right now, we have the ability to come here and watch papers blow around as we meet in the field and talk about Jesus. 
That's part of what happens, right? So uh, if you have your Bibles, we'll be in the book of James today. Our slide, well, I'm sure we'll have the uh, words up on the screen. That was one of the things Savannah was fixing for us. But we're in chapter 5 of James, and we'll be starting today down in verse 7. And you, you can almost kind of feel that James is getting to the end of this letter, right? He's really thrown some strong uh, lessons to us, if you will. He's used some strong language and almost you can kind of see it, okay, after we got through all the lessons here, now we're starting to kind of calm down towards the end, uh, that slow ending to a song, if you will. But I, I've loved this. Have you guys loved this study of James? I mean, is, this is not just great wisdom for Christ followers. This is really great wisdom for people in general. And so we've just had a good time through this. There's two more weeks. We started this, by the way, the week after Christmas. We've been in James the entire year, and it's going to end the, the week before Easter, or as we call it, Resurrection Sunday. Um, that's hard to imagine. Resurrection Sunday is like two weeks from now, isn't it? Um, we will have two services. Um, well, real quick, uh, on that note, we have two entrances here now. You guys know why that is, because there's a lot of construction going on. There's piles of uh, stuff on the other side of the building over there, uh, creating some need for some more parking. And so that created an extra door. Uh, Tim mentioned Rich and Becky. They head up our uh, welcome team. So if you have a chance to, and if you've signed up to help them greet at a door, whether now or in the building, or maybe you've hearing this for the first time and you say, I'd like to do that, just meet them at the gate on the way out. He's the super tall guy. Um, uh, we like to joke like that. But Rich and Becky will be at that door. They'll get, a, get you on a schedule and tell you what that looks like. It starts off as gate greeters, which will turn into door greeters one day in the, in the not so distant future. But if you have your Bibles, uh, chapter 5 of the book of James, uh, thank you, John, what a great message last week about this warning of oppressing others, right? And James talked about that twice now in this book. Um, then he uses this phrase, be patient. Um, I, I glanced over that this week as I was studying, and I kind of went past that and onto the, what, what I would refer to as the rest of the meat. But you know what? Be patient, Remember, James is writing this to a bunch of churches, a scattered churches, and arguably, really, this is written to us, right? This is not just something to them, and they were to throw it in the trash when they were done. This is wisdom. This is the Word of God. And he starts this with, be patient, then brothers and sisters. Um, something else I noticed as I was studying this week, this phrase, brothers and sisters, he has used this phrase so often. The Greek word for that is adelphos, which means believers or, uh, you know, Christ followers, if you will. Be patient then, brothers and sisters. That phrase, brothers and sisters, is mentioned 15 times in the book of James. Did you guys know that? He's saying, I'm with you. We're together. I, you may be over here, in a, you know, scattered out of Jerusalem, and I may be over here in Jerusalem writing you a letter, but we're together. We're the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, Adelphos, Christ's family. Be patient then until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. We talked a couple weeks ago about boasting about tomorrow. Remember, James had some warnings about that. Don't be boasting about tomorrow. He did not say don't make plans. He just talked about planning here, right, like a farmer would make plans. He was talking about the arrogance of not assuming God has any ability to change your future, as we learn here all the time, and the arrogance of not assuming God wants to be part of your plan. So he didn't, he wasn't warning about not planning, that's just not smart. We should be people who plan, but maybe you should have God be part of the this situation, be part of the plan, right? Maybe ask his guidance on some things. Here he's talking about um, wait until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for his land, right? He waits for the rain, waiting for his crop. You may be in the process right now of sharing your faith with someone, and you don't see anything happening. You don't see the results, and you get frustrated. I have some of those. Uh, me and my wife talk about this often. Like, I don't see any fruit of what we're doing here. And she's like, be patient. Let God work the field. Let God nurture the crop. And she's so right on that. She has to calm me down because I'll get impatient. Verse 8, um, James says one of the, you know, I say this a lot because I have a lot of favorite verses in the Bible, but this one is just so powerful and simple all in itself. Verse 8, he says this, you too, right, just like the farmer's patient, you too be patient and stand firm. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. This was written 2,000 years ago. 
I don't know what near is in y'all's world or what the uh, attitude of a long time and a short time is. 2,000 years to me seems like a long time, but it's really just that close. For all we know, the Lord's day is tomorrow. We are just called to be ready, be patient, and then stand firm. That's an interesting phrase, this idea of being patient, right? We're all learning patience. If you need to get some, have some teenagers or get around ours, and you will learn patience. But stand firm. You know, that reminded me to Ephesians 6 where Paul writes the church at Ephesus uh, from a jail cell, right, where he writes a lot of his stuff. And uh, oftentimes in jail, you are, you are linked to, sometimes by chain or sometimes just in the, in the cell you're in, a Roman guard. And so all day long, he's looking at a Roman guard. And so he uses that to talk about standing firm. It's called the full armor of God. If you guys have not studied that, we will later in the year. Uh, the full armor of God. How do you get yourself ready for battle? And he talks about the actual physical armor that a guard may have, likening it to how we get our spirits ready. And so he uses in that, in that lesson that Paul writes there, the phrase stand or stand firm, be ready. You are a child of the living God. Act like it. Stand firm. Another one of my favorite verses is Proverbs 28.1. It says, uh, the wicked flee though no one pursues. But the righteous are as bold as a lion. Imagine having the ability to just be bold because you've readied yourself with Christ. You've, you can stand firm. There's a story about a pastor who had an associate pastor, and he was grooming him, and the associate pastor uh, got an offer from a church across town. And so he took the job, and they communicated the best they could. But after, as time goes on, you have a own, your own bunch of people to pastor, and not long after that, the, the sending pastor, the original pastor, his son had died. And the associate pastor that went across town, he, he just couldn't understand. He kept asking God, why him? What, what, what's happened? He's such a great guy. And then one day he was in a grocery store and he ran into his ex-boss and they were catching up. And, and his ex-boss had, had shared and confided with him that I, I, I've been going through it. I, I've been so depressed from this. I, I even committed, I even thought about committing suicide at one point. And the, the young pastor that had been trained up by him looked at me and said, what you don't understand is I've been talking to God about this. This has been eating me up. And I asked God, why him? And the response that God gave me, he said, was I knew he could look Satan in the eye. A Christ family, you may be in a test right now. You may, be being, you may be in the middle of going through something, but maybe it's because God knows you can look Satan in the eye. Maybe it's because he has so much faith in you that you can do it, that he can get you through it. You can do it together. Maybe it's because you can look Satan in the eye. Be patient. Stand firm. You are who you are. If you have claimed Christ, he's got you. You, you are being supported by the most the greatest support cast you can ever ask for, right? God has got you. Be patient. Stand firm. Then he rolls into this little more lesson, verse 9. He says, don't grumble against one another. This is the second time he's talked about this. Church, how effective are we, brothers and sisters, Adelphus, how effective are we going to be if we're grumbling here? Uh, there was certainly a lot that could, we could grumble about over the last week or so with computers failing and trying to figure it out and all the things that come into, but none of that matters, right? One day standing in front of Jesus, will it matter that this screen didn't print the right way or, or the, the name slide? Didn't, like, that'll never matter, right? It'll lead to grumbling. We don't do that, brothers and sisters. Adelphos, do not grumble against one another or you will be judged. And now let's listen to this. The judge, that's a capital J, he's talking about God here, is standing at the door. Do not grumble amongst each other. Brothers and sisters, we don't do that. We love each other. We go to each other. I, I've been asked over the last couple of weeks, there's been some uh, situations, not necessarily in this body, but where somebody would call me and say, I, I'm seeing something here. I, I, how do I go and approach this person? Or how, what do I do when I get there? And, and my answer is, well, first of all, you got that right. You go to them, Right. Matthew 18 talks clearly about this. If you have something with your brother or sister, you go right to them, nobody else. But the, but the answer to that is you go there with love. And everything we do with love, there's not, there's not a critical spirit we need. If you're trying to draw somebody back to Christ, you should do it in love, right? That is the fix. 
I don't know if you guys care about your current, uh, who you voted for president or who you voted for governor and all those things that doesn't even matter. But isn't the win that they get their heart drawn back to Christ and start governing God's way? That, that's the win, not to get somebody kicked out of office or get them told or get them fired. Or like the win is that Jesus gets the win, right? We go to people in love and maybe that's the, maybe that's the win. The judge is standing at the door. He's the judge, not us. God gets to say, good, well done, good and faithful servant or not. Not us. Our, our attitude is not to be grumbling. In verse 10, he goes and he says, Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. I was just reading the book of Habakkuk this week. Uh, once again, you might have pronounced that Habakkuk in your day. I don't know what's right or wrong. I mean, that's just a weird name. I'm glad that um, Dwayne picked that whole list of weird names for him, and I don't have to do that one today. But um, in the book of Habakkuk, you can see Habakkuk crying out to God. Why is this happening? Why is this allowed to happen in the world? Why is there so much corruption, Lord? Why, why does it seem like the enemy is always winning? And God responds to him in chapter 2. He says, basically, I got this. Don't you worry about that. Don't you worry about that. I'm still in control. Yes, the world is full of, the world's full of evil. Let's just say it. Y'all can see it, right? It is full of corruption. It's full of critical spirits, negativity, finger pointing. God's got that. That's not our job to worry about that. Our job is to go make disciples, to go show the love of Jesus. And that's what Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, however you prefer, in chapter 3, responds, Lord, you're right. You are almighty God. I'll wait for you. Our job is to go make disciples. Let the government be the government. Let the corruption be the corruption. Let social media be social media. That affects us zero. Our job is to go make disciples, right? Even the minor prophets knew that. Brothers and sisters, once again, brothers and sisters, family. I know you're, you may be far away and, and, and I'm over here, but, but I got this. You know, I, I was, had the opportunity to meet with a couple of pastors from uh, the other churches in the Tampa Bay area. There's about um, 15 or 20 of us that meet once a quarter. And it's just uh, ministers who live life together. And the neat thing is, I, as I love this so much, it's something that I, I imagine a lot of churches try to do, get together, you know, the, the preachers and ministers and elders from other churches. But there's something special about this group of guys. There is zero competition. You know, I, I don't know where this came from, this idea of this church versus that church, and we're trying to get this member from that church. And, and I don't think God likes that at all. I think we should all be on the same mission. And I, and I love hanging out with these guys I spent the last year meeting with them uh, once a quarter, and we just build each other up, and we're real, and we talk about life and what's going on in our lives and what's, what's holding us back and what's draining us and, and what's, what's building us up, what's giving us encouragement. And, and I love to brag on you guys in these, meeting, uh, in these meetings. They still cannot believe that we grow meeting in the woods. Some of these guys are like in, in big churches and big comfy places with gyms and and then I say, well, we meet out in the woods under a shade, and they're like, and you're growing. Yeah, because the Spirit of God's in charge here. We don't grumble. We stand firm, and we love each other. That's how we do it here. The Spirit of God is living and active in this place, and I'm proud to brag on you guys because I just see it happen so much. And, and to brag on Frank today is, is the tip of the iceberg of what you guys do around here. Verse 11. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. That word persevere is funny, right? Once again, to brag on you guys, we do that here. Persevere is like no matter what, no exception, without fail, we're going this direction, even if it doesn't look like there's a successful outcome. Even in, in adversity, we're going forward. That's what we do here. We don't know what the end looks like. We think we got some ideas of some stuff that might happen, but... We don't really know. We just know we're here to make, make Jesus famous, right? Right, Dave? We're going to make Jesus' name famous in this place. That's our job. We count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. Listen to this. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. 
if we're not careful, we can read the story of Job and just read it analytically or, or you put it in your mind as something that happened. If you guys don't know the, the story of Job, it's a great read. It's a great book of the Bible. Uh, I'll kind of give you a quick synopsis of it. Uh, Job is a wealthy man. He's, he's well-to-do. He's got a lot of family he's doing, but he's a God-fearing man. And one day, uh, God calls roll call, and, and all of creation lines up, all the spirit all the spirits uh, of you know, the spiritual realms line up, and guess who shows up? Satan, because he has to. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but God still owns Satan. He has a destination for him, but he still has to come when God calls. And God looks at Satan in the eyes, and he says, have you considered my servant Job? Wait a minute. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know if I'd, I'd like to be in Job's shoes there. But you see, God was throwing out a... a he was throwing out a, ta a challenge using a guy by the name of Job. You're allowed to do anything you want to him, just spare his life. And I, I'm making this story short here for the, for the sake of the morning, but he was, Job lost everything in one day. Children, animals, possessions. There's a second challenge as Job refuses to turn his back on God. And so God calls roll call a second time and Satan shows up because he has to. And he says, have you considered my servant Job? Yeah, well, you know, he's, he's doing okay. You, you know, we did, all of his stuff's gone. And he says, well, you can, you can do whatever you want to him. Just don't kill him. And so Satan is allowed to inflict him with all kinds of sores and his body is beat up. And then Job has three really good friends that show up. And they were great friends for a week. And then they opened this thing. And they got him in some trouble, right? But through all this, Job never turned his back on God. Even his wife was questioning him. Well, what do you think? Just curse him and let's get over this. And Job refused. He was patient and he stood firm with who he believed in. And at the end of that story, God gives all of his stuff back and more because of his perseverance. But God didn't do it so that we know the story. God did it because he is full of compassion and mercy. That's our God. He saw what Job was going through. He sees what you're going through and me. And we all go through stuff and we don't always understand the whys. We don't understand the outcomes. And that's really easy to do. Because once again, like we talked a couple weeks ago, God's ways and thoughts are up here and ours are down here. And we just have to trust that God's plan is going to be perfect for us. But I believe God restored Job's stuff because of his compassion and his mercy. And he has that same compassion and that same mercy for each one of us here. He ends this little thought with, with a weird but awesome um, lesson here. Uh, verse 12. Once again, he starts with two words that if I looked past, I would have missed the, I would have missed the lesson here. But he used the words above all. Listen, all the stuff that I've been talking about. This, this stuff from the back of the, the beginning of the book, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds because God's working on your perseverance, which makes you perfect, right? Then he talked about listening and doing, like don't just hear what God says, go do it, put it into action, right? And he talked about for, forbidding favoritism, don't look down on people because of what they look like or how much money they have. Uh, faith and deeds, don't just uh, say you have faith, act like it. Do you do what, is what you do a mirror of what you say you have as far as faith? Is it a mirror of who you believe in? Taming the tongue, like we should be watching what we say. We should only be saying things to build other people up. Different types of wisdom, submitting yourself to God, boasting about tomorrow. All those lessons you guys just got through, and now James says, above all. Above all this. On top of all that that you just, you just read, do not swear. Not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you'll be condemned. That's big, bold words right there. Hope you guys don't miss that. Above all the teaching you just heard, don't swear. Yes is yes and no is no. We have got to learn to be yes and no Christians. Can I count on you? When you say you're going to be somewhere or do something, it should be just like that. We don't need a pinky swear. We don't need to say, well, I promise this time. I swear to God this time. I know I bailed out on you last time, but this time, because you know what you do when you do that. When you swear by God, 
and you don't come through with what you said you were going to do, what do you think that you told that person about who God really is, about how much you actually believe in them, and then you're going to try to share and bring them to this God that you don't really believe in, or at least not enough to keep your word for? That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about taking oath. If you get called to court tomorrow for a testimony or whatever, they're going to make you take an oath on a Bible, probably, probably, right? Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying we, as Christ followers, Adelphos, brothers and sisters, we need to be people known to be of our word. Because if you aren't, I bet if you're good at all these other things, it doesn't really matter, does it? In fact, why even believe that stuff if I can't trust you to be a yes or no Christian? Um, oftentimes, the yes in this passage gets most of the... Um, most of the highlight, most of the teaching, but how about no? How is your no? Is your no broken? Not, not no's. Is your no broken? Guys, there is a time to say no to something. In Mark chapter 3, uh, Jesus calls his disciples, which by the way was a lot of them early on in his ministry, a lot of followers. But in Mark chapter 3, he says he goes up on a mountain, on the side of a mountain, and he calls the 12 he wanted. And they came to him so that they could live with him, so that he could send them out to teach and, and heal. But he picked only 12, guys. That means some people got told no. And Jesus did not apologize about it. He wasn't mean about it. I'm not saying we have to be mean about it, but you have to be very wise with your time. Uh, uh, I heard a saying one time that I, I love it and I use. It goes like this. Sometimes you have to say no to some very good things so that you can say yes to the very best things. I can get caught up in saying yes to a lot of things I want to do, a lot of my things that I like. I, I, I love to serve, and I, it's hard for me to say no. But there's some very best things that I, I will neglect if I don't stop saying yes to everything. We have got to get good at saying no politely in love, but you only have so much time. I hope you guys know that time is your most precious commodity that you have. Money comes and goes. Stuff comes and goes. Uh, even situations come and go, but once a second clicks off that clock, y'all, it's gone forever. We, we only have that one second. Once it's gone, it's gone. No is a good thing so that your time you have here is spent on the very best things. Be patient. Stand firm. Be people whose yes is yes and no is no. And so the challenge this week is to do just that. We don't need to be Swearing, and I'm, I, I know I meant it last time, but this time I'm for real. Yes and no, Christians, right? Be patient. Stand firm. God may be in the middle of using this Adelphos, this body of believers, these brothers and sisters, to conquer Satan in another challenge. And I believe that he is. Are you guys with me on that? Let's do it together. Father, I am so in love with you. I am so in love with this body of people. Who am I that you'd pick me to be part of these people's lives? Who am I that you would bless me enough to, to and give me the words to even speak on a stage in front of people? That is only from you. I am just not that smart. <laughs> Father, who am I that you would pick me to be saved, to have my name written in the book of life? You've seen my past, but yet you love me anyway. So God, teach us, teach us as Christ's family Christian church to be patient people and to stand firm, knowing who we are and whose we are, knowing who we serve. That's you, Lord. It doesn't get any better than that. How we not want to be yes and no Christians, people who, who just, when our word means what it is, as we already talked about, uh, Jesus had a command and a commitment to us, a promise he made to us, and he kept it. Teach us to do the same thing, God. Teach us to be yes and no Christians that just stand firm in the truth, to be bold as a lion as we walk through life because you've got us held up in your mighty right hand. I thank you for that beautiful hand, Lord. It's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Would you please stand, church? As we do this, uh, sing this closing song here, just, just a reminder, church, and, and for those that are visiting with us for the first time here today, we do have prayer counselors that will be standing over here to the side. Um, if you are in need of a, of, of a prayer, if you have wanna, just want to have a conversation, and of course, church, we always pray for each other. Amen? Amen. You ready to close out this beautiful, beautiful day with a wonderful song here? I guess that's a yes. <laughs> here we go. <laughs>
child inside we left for growing old Church, have an awesome, awesome week. Be blessed.